Where I get my ideas from, I have no clue, because I sometimes don't get any ideas. And a lot of, t of the time, one uh, finds the ideas start to evolve on paper. In fact, it's very difficult to think of anything without a sheet of paper in front of you. You know, to uh, start developing a, uh, I don't know, a point of view about something. Even if it's an illustration for an article or a book or something. That you need the paper and start the old doodles going. Because what you've got to do is develop a dialogue. Anyway, that's the sort of old chestnut of, uh, of questions that people ask. I suppose artists are just very good people for filling spaces. Imagine a newspaper without, without a, a hole in it with a picture in there. You know, that's... It'd be like the front page of the old times, you know, which was just really a, just a mass of type. We have this huge capacity for accepting and digesting bullshit, you know, as a nation. All nations are the same. They just want a leader, somebody up there that's strong enough to tell them things, and they'll, they want to believe it, you know, they want to believe that policies are right and, and that this is the way to go. Sheep are wonderful because they're stupid, for a start. They like people, but they're stupid and smart. They're, you try and catch, if you're trying to catch one in a flock and you're going around the field like this, they have a wonderful way of, they can see when they're being cornered. And they're ready, they're, then they, they start a sort of a counter movement uh, through a gap in such a way that you never, you, it's, it's like a leak in your, in your central heating system. But Zeno is a sheep of certain wisdom. What you need to know, he can provide. Whether it's the answer to a question or a fear that troubles you inside. So that's why I used to consult him. And the farmer just said to me, when I said, you take them to market tomorrow. This is before I owned Zeno. I said, yep. I said, uh, well, they'll go, well, they'll go, well, they'll just be bought. Be on the butcher's block by Wednesday, down the sewer by Friday. And imagine having to do that to someone I'd had this deep, meaningful relationship. So I had to buy him. You know, I had to pay him the price. He was very fair about it. What, how much he cost a pound. So Zeno was just meat to anyone else. But he's a mind to me, you know. And people don't usually, presumably, talk to sheep as philosophers. But Zeno was a philosopher. The irony of it all was that I was developing a relationship with this sheep based on an intellectual intercourse, right? You'll pardon the expression. Talking about sheep, as we were. You can have a you can have a nasty relationship with a sheep if you want. You know, you have all sorts of relationships with sheep. We could make a tremendous video nasty with with a flock of sheep and a rabid sex maniac. Imagine that, you know. And uh, I've managed to keep sex maniacs at bay. I mean, I never have sex maniacs as a rule, as far as I know, as friends. So I don't mind them going to see my flock, you know. But I don't actually uh, encourage people even starting to talk dirty in front of my sheep, you know. Because they get the sheep going, you see. That's the other thing. They start sort of proffering themselves to use, you know. Terrible. They, they are. I mean, they're, they're as bad as anyone else, you see. Just the same. So if you showed a video nasty to a flock of sheep, you would have all sorts of mayhem, you know. Filthy mayhem. Oh, dear. You'd really see life in the raw if you showed a flock of sheep. Video nasties. Censorship. The case against censorship. Who needs to hear anybody going to the toilet? Is it good for their soul? Is it something that you feel is a necessary part of our everyday life? The sound of a chain being pulled? What do we need it for? People are like children, you know, you give them anything. They simply, uh, they go crazy. And if you give them one thing that's a little bit more than before, they'll want more and more. There's no end to it, you see. You've got to stop people having fun. It's the important thing. Syphilis and gonorrhea, these are the consequences of no censorship. Cherrywood Cannon is a tale of a paranoid king a king who lived in black mountains and it happened to be the year of the king's jubilee and he wanted something to celebrate that fact so he thought i've got a good idea what about 
I tell you what can and see. Fill it full of gunpowder and blow it up, you know. But blow it up in someone's face, you see. The enemy. See? It was that sort of a thing. So eventually they find the Chelywood. Meanwhile, back in the town, the people have their fighting uh, festivals and they eat the meat in front of the soup, before the soup, in case of attack. Eventually, the cannon is ready and the king must choose seven people to be the chosen proud seven to take the cannon to the very highest spot where the eagles themselves live and set the cannon up and wait for the enemy. Finally at the top, they say, we must feed the cannon with gunpowder, so they feed it with gunpowder, more gunpowder, more gunpowder. They feed it so tightly because their hatred is so big and their paranoia. And then they wait. And in the night, somebody thinks they see the enemy. The uh, captain shouts, fire. There's a tremendous explosion, fantastic explosion. It blows them all apart arms and legs everywhere. They're lying there, heads on the floor and everything. And the captain, whose pride burns more fiercely than his hatred at this moment, gasps through the last teeth in his head. If it's done this to us, think what it's done to the enemy. Meanwhile, on the lower slopes where the peasants live, going about their work, they think, think they hear a thunderstorm. And they rush home and close the doors and eat their soup before the meat in the right order.